The biggest news probably on the domestic front was that beating in Cincinnati where several policemen beat a black man with clubs, better known as police batons, and the man went to the hospital and died. It turned out that he had some drugs in his system, so that makes everything all right. Obviously, he was stronger than Atlas because he had PCP in his body, and that gives people superhuman strength, and so it's all all right. Very interesting thing about it, I noticed when I saw this on television, I saw Wolf Blitzer talking about it on CNN with some people, and the viewpoint, apparently the accepted viewpoint, is that you shouldn't take the televised or video tape of the beating, which was there for everybody to see because the police car had a video camera on its dashboard and was taping the whole incident. You shouldn't take this too much at face value because you don't see the whole thing. You don't see what happened before the police started beating this man, and you don't see that perhaps it was impossible to subdue him in any other way, and so on and so forth. And it was a very pro-police viewpoint. And I couldn't help but think, that isn't the way it went down when Rodney King was beaten by policemen back in 1991. There, there was a hue and cry, and they played that videotape snippet over and over and over and over again. And the amazing thing was that when the policemen were acquitted by a jury in Simi, California, and the Los Angeles riots began, the television stations and the networks kept playing the video snippet over and over and over again as though to say, look, look, look at the injustice that has happened here. Let's go out and bomb some stores in Los Angeles. Let's beat up on some people. Let's uh, cause a riot here. Look at, look at, look at. Don't forget that this is what happened to Rodney King. And it really is strange the way the powers that be in the media just suddenly changed their opinion. I mean, they were not all that enthusiastic about Clinton's war, for instance, and they're very enthusiastic and have been so about Bush's war. And yet, the media is supposed to be decidedly Democratic rather than Republican. So you never really know what to expect from them. But there's a further look that this case, I think, warrants. And there's a very interesting article by Llewellyn Rockwell, Jr., better known as Lou Rockwell, on his own site uh, this past week on Thursday. And I have it on my radio links page. If you go to my website, harrybrown.org, click on the radio page, and there you'll see links to articles and websites mentioned on the broadcast. And there is a link to Lou Rockwell's article, that's Cincinnati Beating. And he points out that this case, as he says, calls attention to a disparity. Quote, Nathaniel Jones, the victim, had passed out in the parking lot of a White Castle restaurant, doing no physical harm to anyone. Not wanting a man lying on its property and not employing private guards, the restaurant called the police. The police roused him, and an unarmed Jones came up swinging hard. He wasn't complying, which is, as we all know, the greatest sin in the eyes of the state. Was he defending himself, or were the police defending themselves? It's unclear. What is clear is that he was hit 40 or 50 times with a metal baton before falling and later dying. dying. Traces of PCP were found in his blood and other drugs in his car. The police department is aggressively de defending itself against charges of abuse. They say the police obeyed regulations in exacting increasingly hard punishments. And yet, apart from taking drugs and trespassing, what precisely had Jones done wrong, aside from resisting arrest? The police tried to arrest the guy, and one thing led to another until Jones was dead. This is in contrast to the case of Rodney King, whose beating followed not only an attempt to resist arrest, but also a dangerous high-speed chase in which a residential neighborhood, uh, pardon me, a high-speed chase in a residential neighborhood that clearly threatened innocence of all sorts. His beating was as much a punishment for this as it was an attempt to restrain. Now, in a world in which property owners had absolute rights, what would have happened to Jones? Could the restaurant owner walk up to a passed-out man on his private property and blast him in the head? Of course not. That would be contrary to normal rules of proportionality. In fact, that would be the equivalent of murder. Later on in the article, Rockwell says, Imagine how private security guards might have handled the matter differently. Walmart, for example, which uses private security. Might they have just helped the man and tried to contact a family member? Might they have sedated him had he become unruly? Or just backed off for a time until the man stopped protesting? Or offered him $20 or a bottle of scotch to just leave? They would have at least understood that beating, let alone killing, people on company property is bad for business. But the restaurant called government police, who believe they can and should use every amount of force they can get away with under the regulations. Well, that's uh, what Rockwell says about it. It's, it's very um, valuable, I think. He goes on to point out that the details are spread across all the Cincinnati papers, and a great irony presents himself. Quote, the case will eventually be referred to the U.S. government for investigation and correction. 
the same U.S. government that has killed thousands and thousands of civilians in Iraq, shoots people on the spot for resisting any of its foreign adventures, and otherwise thinks nothing of destroying life, not just for one person, but for thousands, and not just for the guilty, but the innocent as well. End of quote. Which is another perspective on this, that there is no investigation of the beatings and the killings that might take place in Iraq. There is no accountability, in other words. But let's go back to the distinction between Walmart private security guards and the police force. The police are not accountable. Oh, yes, there are police review boards, there are internal affairs, there are all these things. But generally speaking, these officers are not going to suffer for what they have done. They may be on suspension for a few days or a week. But suppose a Walmart security guard had killed Nathaniel Jones by beating him. Do you think that he would not be tried for murder or at least manslaughter and probably sent away to prison for some time? And the interesting thing that Rockwell points out in this article is that Walmart knows that somebody dying on its property is bad for business. Well, what's bad for government business? I'm sorry, I can't think of anything. There isn't anything that's bad for government business. Government overspends, government kills people, government sends people to prison, sometimes executes them falsely, and nobody ever pays the consequences for it. No one ever loses his job. No one ever takes a cut in pay. No one ever is tried on charges for these things. No one ever goes to prison for the mistakes that government people make. And we come back again to the war in Iraq and the 9-11 affair and all of these other things that have been going on in the public eye for the past few years, but actually have been going on for the last 50 years in American foreign policy. And the question that I have asked over and over again on this broadcast, with the U.S. government collecting $2 trillion a year of our money, that's $2 trillion a year of our money, can't they come up with a better system of protecting us than just taking a club and going ar around the world and beating people to death in Afghanistan, Iraq, and other places, Panama, Haiti, Nicaragua, all these places that our government has just gone out and killed people? Isn't there some way that for $2 trillion a year we could buy the ideas of the smartest people in the world to come up with a better system of making us safe? And in the same way, couldn't local governments, state governments, federal government, with all the money they take from us, come up with a better way of dealing with a 400-pound man who is high on drugs on private property and is causing a minor disturbance than to just beat the man to death? Isn't there something that could have been done? Well, all the innovations that come with this government money are in the form of technology to make the police or the military more effective. None of it is designed to make sure that innocent people are less likely to be hurt or that guilty people are not going to be hurt disproportionately, that the punishment truly will fit the crime and that the police will not kill somebody for trespassing on private property. Well, I'd like to have your thoughts on this and even some ideas on what might make government more effective. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes after these important announcements. This is Harry Brown. Call me at 1-800-510-TALK. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown. I forgot to mention something at the beginning of the show. Imagine I forgot to mention something. First time in my life that I've forgotten anything. Well, almost. You also can email me. Unlike the last couple of weeks, I'm back at home now, and email facilities are up and working. Just send your question or comment to question at harrybrown.org, question at harrybrown.org, or q at harrybrown.org. In either case, Brown has an E on it. Well, let's see what's going on out in the real world. Let's talk first with Carol in Georgia. Good evening, Carol. Hi. Hello, Harry. Hello there. I enjoy your program. Well, thank you. And uh, I really appreciate you being out there, and I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to make a couple of comments that um, are, I really, uh, they're simple analogies, simple comments, but I appreciate this forum. Um, like you, I also watched some of the cable coverage of the beating. Um, and did what, you, did, pardon me for interrupting you, but since you watched obviously some things that I didn't see, did you also get the same impression that there was a, a decidedly pro-police uh, viewpoint this exactly. time around? As a matter of fact, it uh, may have been on CNN, probably Fox, but I was just disturbed when they were explaining to the viewers that the beating was not that severe because these metal um, um, batons? The, the batons that they had were hollow inside. So they said, you know, that, of course, the beating was not that severe. But, you know, when you look at the video again, you see them jabbing the baton. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the difference of, say, someone hitting you with a hairbrush as opposed to jabbing you with a hairbrush. The, the, sure. impact, the sure. impact is much more se severe. And, and in, in the video, you see one policeman standing over him, jabbing him, not beating him, but jabbing him with all of his weight. I mean, the policeman obviously weighed close to 200 pounds, and he's taking the baton and jabbing him. 
Yes, the difference is that if he hits him with a baton, it apparently is trying to render him unconscious so that they can handcuff him and carry him off, carry him off to jail. But if he jabs him, then he's trying to hurt him. Repeatedly. And, I mean, and, and of course, you can say that the idea of hurting him is to get him to stop so that he will stop, uh, so that that will stop the pain for him. But as you point out, it is a very, very painful thing. Yeah, the intent was to injure. And, and you see that it was a repeated jabbing with a baton. It, you can see clearly. Sure. I mean, you don't have to be told how to think about this, that the intent was the man standing over him and throwing his entire weight into this hollow baton, but yet it was jabbing. It was not uh, a strike. It was a, a penetrating jabbing. Well, if the, and if the baton being hollow doesn't hurt very much, then why do they have them in the first place? What are they supposed to be used for if they don't uh, inflict some kind of damage on the person? What's the point of having it? You might right. as... and, and to strike with a hollow baton would imply there was going to be some kind of sting. But mm. to jab... There's a different impact. Sure. Okay, well, what, uh, what's your viewpoint on all this then? Well, I think it was brutal, most definitely. I think that it was brutal, and in perhaps maybe another community, if there had been uh, perhaps a white or black or Hispanic youth out on a Friday or Saturday night drinking, perhaps partaking in some sort of social recreation drug, I mean, I think that as parents, you know, any of us who have children, their children could have have been in that scenario where they could have partaken in drink or, or drugs, could have, and to be beat to death and try to justify that, oh, well, they had been high prior to this. Sure. I don't think that that would set right in other communities. And I have one other comment, too, that I'd really appreciate if, you, if you'd let me make. Go ahead. This uh, young woman who's missing, Drew, um, of course, it's heartbreaking that she is missing and, and she is uh, very loved by her family. But, you know, they've, they've arrested a man already. And last I heard, it's not really clear, uh, except that he um, has prior convictions. Uh, I don't think that they've been very forthcoming as to saying what is linking him to this crime, except that he apparently lives in this community and he has prior convictions. But what I found disturbing also this week was that his court-appointed attorney, when asked, well, by, asked by one of the news commentators, once again on Fox, he asked the court-appointed attorney, it must, it's going to be difficult for you to handle this kind of case because the young woman is beautiful and she's well-loved and uh, it's, it's a tragic situation. But he asked the court-appointed attorney, um, it's going to be difficult for, for you to handle this kind of emotionally charged case. And I'm sorry, Carol. We're going to have to take a break. Uh, hang on there with that thought, and we'll be right back after these announcements. This is Harry Brown. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown, and we're talking with Carol in Georgia, and Carol mentioned that in this case of the... I believe it's a missing woman, uh, that they have somebody in custody and someone on television asked the court-appointed defense attorney how he could possibly defend this case when the odds seem to be stacked against him. Is that the case? So, so what, did, what did the uh, defense attorney reply? What he replied was so shocking to me. His exact words were, it was my week. Uh, that I had to take the case. That's right. It yeah. was my week. And, you know, I thought of other high-profile cases. I mean, public opinion, when the OJ case was going on, was that he did it. Public opinion for the Scott Pearson case is he did it. Oh, well, public opinion in this case you know, is probably he, he, he did it, too. But you didn't see O.J.'s attorney, and you, do, you don't hear Scott Peterson's attorney going around saying, it was my week. Yeah, sure. Well, that brings up two points. Uh, the first is, of course, that it is true that money is necessary to mount a good defense because exactly. the pros prosecution can simply overwhelm the defense with all kinds of expert witnesses and various other things. And even though it is the prosecution's burden to prove the case, and if the person is innocent, he really shouldn't even have to mount a defense at all because it would be impossible for the prosecution to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt since the person is innocent. That isn't true in practice, as we know, and judges, of course, can be very biased and can regulate what can be said and heard in a, a case and can give instructions to a jury. So it is necessary to have money to defend yourself. The second thing is the appalling lack of understanding about the rule of law, rules of evidence, and the Bill of Rights on the part of people on television. I have heard more than once people like Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity saying to some defense attorney, how could you possibly defend this case? The guy is guilty. It's dead to rights. And how do I know this? Because I saw the prosecuting attorney's news conference in which he said, we've got this guy dead to rights, and so that's all that I need to know. And I sometimes think to myself, why do we waste all this money on juries and trials and judges and so forth when and all we have to do is ask Bill O'Reilly whether somebody's guilty or innocent, and we'll get the answer straight from the right hand of God. Carol, thanks so much for calling. Thank well, you. Let's go now to Arizona and talk with Rex. Good evening, Rex. Yeah, good evening. I, I have a question for you. Sure. As a, as a citizen of the United States, do you not have a legal obligation to obey the commands of a police officer? If they tell you to stop, 
you're supposed to stop. If they tell you to lie down, you're supposed to lie down. If they tell you to put your hands up, you're supposed to put your hands up. Is that true? Uh, if he tells me to take my clothes off, do I have to take my clothes off? Uh, now, don't go to the extreme. No, I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to the extreme. What, what you're saying, what you're saying, is that we have to assume that anything that a policeman asks me to do is reasonable. And of course, I would obey the policeman simply because I don't want to get my brains beat out. I don't want to be accused of resisting arrest. I don't want to get into any more trouble than somehow I've already gotten myself into by the mere fact that policemen are starting to issue orders at me. But the but to assume that the policemen are always right is the hallmark of a police state in okay, which wait, wait, the wait, government stop. can't do anything wrong. But that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying as a law-abiding citizen, and a policeman tells you to stop, then you obey the order, yes or no? Well, I will, but only for self-preservation, not because I believe that the policeman has a right to order me around and tell me what to do. I don't believe that. Well, as a citizen of the United States and believing in the laws of the country and of, of the state... I'm sorry, uh, you've, you've, lost, you've lost me already. I don't believe in the laws of the country. There are all sorts of unjust laws in this country, and I do not believe in all of them. And if I were on a jury, I would vote to acquit in many cases, even if it could be proven that the person had violated a particular law, if I think that law is unjust. I am not going to tell you that I believe in all the laws of the country and that, therefore, I will uh, obey them all. I have violated laws in my life, and I have no shame about it whatsoever. I wouldn't be surprised if you had, too, as a law abiding citizen of the United States. There is no special sacred sense of the government in my mind. The government is force, and the government is political influence, and the government is power. And I don't look at that as some kind of sacrosanct agency that has a right to tell me what to do and that I have to just uh, meekly obey whatever any government official says. I will, in many cases, obey, but again, simply because of self-preservation, because I don't want to go to prison for 15 years. Well, now, let me clarify, but you do believe that if you don't agree with a particular law, you can campaign to have that law changed, yes? And you yeah, yeah and, a, and, a, and, a fat, right? and a fat lot of good that's going to do. <laughs> and I've been campaigning for 30 years to end the drug war in America, and a lot of good that's done me. Well, can you get enough people to agree with you to vote in your, you know, along with you? Can you get enough uh, lawmakers and legislators to agree with you, or are you are you are you su suggesting laws that are totally irrational and are unreasonable that the majority of people that they won't vote to support your concepts? I mean, come on, we live in a democracy. If if you've got an idea that makes sense and you can get. 60, 70, or 80 percent of the voters to say, you know what, he's right, he's, he's clear thinking, I totally support him, then you can change the laws. But you can't, you, you can't just say, look, I'm not going to obey the law. If you're going to not obey the law, you're going to suffer the consequences. And that's exactly what happened to this gentleman that was high on, on, uh, on drugs. I see. And when the, when the Bush children were high on alcohol, if they had somehow disobeyed a police officer because they weren't thinking clearly, then uh, they might have been killed. They might have been sent off to prison for resisting arrest. They might have done a lot of other things. I really doubt it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You run from the police. The police catch you. You run from the police. You pay the penalty. Because and the because care, the police are care, always right. And the I don't care. I don't care who you are. You are. I, we've got examples here in Arizona from very powerful teenagers, uh, children of leaders who have run from the police and suffered the consequences. And believe me, it's brought a great deal of shame to their parents. And I'm just telling you that this man was high on drugs, and when he refused to obey the commands, then they had to figure. They had, they're trained to subdue you. They're trained to get you under control. Because guess what? You're out of control. You don't. You can't. You know, it's so frustrating for me to understand and listen to people that have never walked in the shoes of a police officer. Well, I, under I understand that a policeman's lot is a dangerous one, but we come back to what I said at the beginning of the show. You think with all the money that these people bleed out of us, that they could buy some knowledge, some wisdom, some understanding, some techniques that do not lead to people dying, that they could find ways of settling disputes that don't involve clubbing people to death, that they could find ways of solving whatever the problem was with Saddam Hussein without going over there and murdering a whole bunch of innocent people, without going into Afghanistan and dropping missiles and bombs, without sending missiles over to the Sudan and other places. You'd think that with all the money that they get from us, that they could buy the best minds in the world to come up with better solutions. But no, all we know is force. All we know is that if you don't agree, if you don't go along, then we will beat you into submission. And believe me, that does not strike me as being a civilized way of handling things. And well, yeah. I am all for civilization. I am all for persuasion. I am all for understanding. I am not for force. And when you tell me that I ought to go out and get a majority of the people to influence those legislators somehow, these are the people who make laws that they don't obey themselves, and you expect me to be able to have some influence over them. There have been polls over the last 10 years showing that a vast majority of the American people think that government is way, way too big, that government is completely out of control, that politicians are considered just slightly worse than used car salesmen in our society, and yet what happens as a result of this vast majority opinion that government 
government is too big and too powerful. Every single year, government gets bigger, government gets more powerful. Every day of the week, they are up there passing bills that they have not read, that they do not understand, but that their party leaders have told them to vote for. And you tell me to go out and just get a majority of the people and we'll change all these bad laws. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, but the list of bad laws runs into the tens of thousands. And if we could even get rid of one of those laws, get one of them off the books, it would be something of a miracle. But laws, once they're on the books, do not get repealed. They do not get repealed. If they do not work, then they become expanded, and the penalties get greater, and the money devoted to enforcing them gets greater. Let me tell you what we're doing here in Arizona. We've developed a vote-by-phone system where we do a talk radio show, and people can call a toll-free number and push one for yes and two for no. It's a plebiscite. It's not a scientific poll, but it gives you the pulse of the community. And it has no force and effect upon the government. No, no, let me tell you it does, because what happens is the telephone numbers are registered into a computer. You get the prefix. You get the area code. You get a feel for what district it's coming from, from a particular politician. And after the survey is done, the information is faxed or emailed to the governor, to the state representative, to the city councilman, to the mayor, and things are happening. The voice of the people is a very powerful thing. But right now, we don't have a media for people to be able to express their opinions. But you also have to have ideas that everybody, not everybody, but at least the majority agree with because that's why we vote. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where do we have to have these ideas that a majority agree with? Do you think a majority of the people in this country uh, agree with the idea that we should be paying billions of dollars every year to farmers, that we should have people enslaved on welfare for the rest of their lives? Do you think a majority of the people in this country believe that America should have troops in over 100 countries around the world? Do you think a majority of the people in this uh, country believe that asset forfeiture is a good thing if they even ever heard of it, that you should be, the police should be able to go and confiscate somebody's property who hasn't even been charged with a crime? Do you think wait, that wait, the wait, people, wait, wait. Uh, you're, you're telling take me one, that I need take, to get a majority. They don't need to get a majority. Take, they pass these laws that the public don't even know about. Take one, give me one example. I know you, you've got a big umbrella there. Just give me one example. For example, pro- property for, forfeiture. You're referring to if, they, if you get prosecuted, if you get No, no, not if you get prosecuted. If the police suspect that your property might have been involved in some crime someplace, they do not need a judge's warrant. They do not need to, to charge you with any crime. They can simply come and take the property, and then you must sue the government to get it back. Okay, and you're talking about if you're growing marijuana in your basement? If they think you're growing marijuana in your basement, they can come and take your house. If they think the money in your pocket might have been part of a money laundering or a drug deal or something else, they can take the money and you have to sue to get it back and you may never be charged with a crime and yet you don't have the money. People have lost their airplanes, people have lost their boats, people have lost their houses, people have lost their cars and all of these things have taken place and not 20% of the American people even know that this is on the books in every law enforcement agency in the country from the federal down to the, to the city level and yet you're telling me i got to go out and get a majority of the people to undo all these uh, terrible laws that are put on the books that the majority of the people don't even know about, let did alone approve of. Did this happen to you? No, it's never happened to me, thank God. Did it happen to, your, did it happen to somebody you know? No, it's never happened to anybody close case, to me. Did you, did you give us a case study? Sure. Donald Scott, us- Donald Scott uh, owned a ranch in Malibu. The police came in with a SWAT team and came in because they were going to confiscate his property. Scott woke up in the middle of the night, got a gun, ran downstairs, and was shot to death. And it turned out that they got an anonymous tip that he was growing marijuana on his property, and they appraised the property before they decided to make the raid on the house. Scott is there. that one. Well, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of cases like it. Yes, we'll be right back after these messages. Thank you for calling, Rex. I appreciate your viewpoint. Let us go now to New Orleans and talk with Mark. Good evening, Mark. Yes, how you doing, Harry? Now, you know there are two of us in New Orleans. Mark and Duarte. I know, and the other Mark is on the line, too, waiting to be heard. I talked to him a few minutes before I dialed in anyway, so we know each other. Okay, Uh, I don't have all the details because I did not clip it out of the time speaking soon. There was an article this past week about a police brutality case back last this past summer by NOPD. And if that cop lover in Arizona, or he might be a cop himself, I don't know, but uh, the, the, the victim here in New Orleans who lives here in New Orleans is also originally from Arizona, coincidentally. Huh. Okay. This what a small world. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, this happened this past summer. I don't remember the man's name. Maybe Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey Dykett might have the paper, or, you know, the, the in Braille or whatever, that he might be able to uh, fill in some of the details. But it was this past summer. Uh, he was in the French Quarter. It was a Saturday night. And uh, the NLPD were doing their usual roundups, accusing people of being drunk and disorderly and throwing them in the paddy wagons and taking them down to central lockup and such. And, of course, yes, a lot of them may have been drunk and disorderly, but uh, the, the particular person in question, he's from Arizona. He is part uh, Hispanic and part um, either Apache or Navajo. He had hair down to his butt. But uh, he, was not, he was not drunk and disorderly, and he did not have drugs on him, neither. He was part of the roundup when they uh, saw his, you know, the name and they saw you know, the length of his hair, and they... But they didn't find any drugs on him, and they're going, yeah, where are your drugs? What'd you do? You, you, you dumped them somewhere, and they're using racial slurs. Oh, God. Which, well, I mean, it's all typical, you know. This happens all the time. I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying it happens all the time. And as they were putting him in the paddy wagon, oh, they got so frustrated because they didn't find drugs on him. That was also written up in the paper. It's only now making news. He's been trying to get people to, to listen to him for some months now. Uh, as he was being arrested, uh, he saw a shiny object with one of the cops. And, uh, I mean, you know, it all happens in a flash. He's in the police van, and one of the other arrestees in the van says, Hey, you're bleeding bad. 
Uh, he has a long and deep laceration on his arm. Uh, when, the, when, he, when the cops realized what happened, instead of taking him in to Charity Hospital uh, with the proper procedures, they just dumped him on the doorstep of Charity Hospital and took off. Hmm. And they didn't arrest him then? Well, I mean, he, you know, there is, uh, some of the records have now somehow disappeared. I don't remember all the specific details. Like I said, I didn't flip it out of the paper this past week. Yeah. Well, that's really unfortunate, and I don't know what to say about it other than, of course, what you're saying is not that unusual. It's not uncommon. There was that woman in Michigan uh, earlier this year or late last year who, uh, they, when they were arresting her, they cut her finger off. I don't remember if you read that story. No, I didn't hear that. Uh, it's not about the rings that were on her. You know, they were trying to handcuff her, and she had rings on her fingers, and one of the fingers, uh, they actually cut off one of her fingers. I, found, I even found that on the Internet, too, the story. You know. Intentionally cut the finger uh, off? I don't know if it was intentional. They claimed it was accidental in the arresting procedure, but, of course, he, he's been completely exonerated. Yes. Well, as I said, very few ever have to pay the consequences for it. Thanks so much okay. for calling in, Thank Mark. You. I appreciate it. Let other people get it, though. Okay. We do have a lot of people lined up on the phone, so I would not suggest calling right now, but I'll keep you informed later in the second hour. Before we go back to the phone, since we only have a minute before the break, let me just make a, a few comments on this subject. First of all, all policemen are not bad. The majority of them are probably good people that you would be glad to have as your neighbor. The problem is the system. First of all, if you're going to have policemen chasing victimless crimes like drugs, uh, prostitution, gambling numbers, the, all of these kinds of things, enforcing no smoking laws and uh, enforcing securities laws and doing all these other things, then you're going to have an overworked police force and you're going to have police in dangerous situations and you're going to have police that are going to have to lie to get convictions by posing in sting operations and things of this sort. You're going to have all sorts of bad situations. So the first rule of making a more civilized society is to quit prosecuting victimless crimes and prosecute only those crimes where somebody is intruding on someone else's person or property without permission. Secondly, we need a better selection process in the police department because it does take an unusual person to be able to handle the kinds of situations we've been discussing tonight, handle them in a way that does not lead to bad consequences. And third, he needs to be trained then in the ways of handling these things so that people don't die. We'll be back right after the news. I hope you stay with me. we got a lot more to go. Although we do have the phones pretty well backed up right now, I'll give you the phone number, 1-800-510-TALK, or email me at question at harrybrown.org. And I'm not sure how many emails we're going to get to. This topic has provoked a lot of discussion, the topic being the police and how to handle situations like this Nathaniel Jones beating that resulted in a death this past week in Cincinnati. And let me just tag on to what I said at the end of the first hour, the point that it is a mistake to hate the police in a situation like this. It is not the police that are the problem. It is the lawmakers who are the problem. It is the lawmakers who have dumped tens and tens and tens of thousands of laws on the books that the police are supposed to enforce. It is the lawmakers who have created the drug war that has resulted in all kinds of police abuses. It is a system that draws to it like a magnet the worst kind of people to be policemen rather than the best kind of people to be policemen. And our ire and our focus should be directed toward the lawmakers who have created this terrible system that has resulted in so many cases of police abuse. Let's talk now with Roger in Clymer, New York. Good evening, Roger. Well, good evening, Harry. Thank you for taking my call. I just wanted to ask you, um, I just didn't understand you uh, the, the last hour. You said something that made no sense whatsoever. Well, I'm always doing that, but what was this one? Well, you said... Um, you were asking people if they had any ideas on how to make government work. I thought you were the primary guy that says the government doesn't work, which it doesn't. I don't believe I said I was asking how to make government work. I said, what was your take on this subject, and how uh, should something like this be handled? But no, you can't make government work because it's an agency of coercion, and the coercion starts by being employed against innocent people to raise the money to be able to defend us against coercion, but it starts with coercion and ends with coercion, and that just simply doesn't work the way voluntary, voluntary arrangements do. Well, yeah, well, anyway, if you don't mind, I wouldn't, would you mind if I change the subject for just by, a second? By all means. Okay, uh, I was watching the Army-Navy game today. And it got rather sickening to see those people, uh, the sports announcers, sitting there and saying what great people the guys from Army and Navy are, which I'm not saying they aren't. But then they show guys that are over in Iraq or Afghanistan or Korea, you know, that used to play in that game. They say, isn't it wonderful that they're fighting for this country, yes. saving us? And I'm sitting there, wait a second, there's a logic missing here someplace. And, I mean, it was just incredible. Well, you know, these guys are all over the world protecting us. And I says, well. From people who have never attacked us. I know, isn't that amazing? And uh, I'm sitting there, I says, I'm still waiting for us to get out of Kosovo and Korea. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, is the Korean War over yet, um, after 53 years? Well, you know, or even that, before World War II, we still have troops over in Europe, don't we? Yeah, of course. Oh, uh, yeah, so, I mean, World War II happened before that, and, uh, you know, it's just, um, and World War One, of course, and, and it's just incredible. You know, the American people are smarter than the politicians give them credit for. I mean, after World War One, you know, and World War Two broke out in Europe, the people over here says, we don't want to get involved. 
But the politician says, no, we're going to make sure that they do get involved sure. in some way. Be- because the people knew that you know, all that killing that happened in World War I was a complete waste. Absolutely. And it took Pearl Harbor in order to rouse the sleeping giant, as they say. And then it turns out that Pearl Harbor, which, of course, the anniversary is tomorrow, but it turns out that Pearl Harbor uh, was not what we were led to believe on December 7th, 1941. And I won't rehash that story again tonight. And if you didn't tune in last week and hear the story, then that's your fault, not mine. Well, it's the same thing. Uh, I've had people sit there, well, what do you think of all the soldiers that fought in the Civil War that wrote afterwards and said it was slavery that was the cause of it? And I says, well, if you got them to believe the lie, so much the better. Yeah, of course. You, well, there's a cer- to a certain extent, it is necessary that somebody who is risking his life, even if he's a conscript, has to believe that there is some higher purpose in all this, that there is some good to come out of it. And one of the things that happened at the end of the First World War was this tremendous sense of disillusionment, this feeling of, oh, my God, this insane killing that took the lives of literally millions and millions of people who were just slaughtered, men jumping out of trenches and being mowed down by machine guns. It had to be for something. And when they realized that it wasn't for anything, that no good came out of it whatsoever and a great deal of bad came out of it, such as the rise of Hitler and the rise of Lenin and Stalin, then there was this tremendous sense of disillusionment which made World War II very, very difficult to sell, especially in America. And that's why it was necessary to bait somebody into attacking the United States. Roger, as always, thanks for calling. I appreciate Thank your you. comments. Mm-hmm. Let's go now to Bill in Arkansas and see what's on his mind. Good evening, Bill. Hello, how are you? I'm just fine. What's Great. up? I, uh, I started out with comments to, at the beginning of the program, and uh, you kept resolving these issues in my mind, and it's been going on and on. It's a great program tonight. I did want to comment about something. If you, I'm from the Cincinnati area, and, uh, you know, this is not the first time these sort of things happen down in Cincinnati. Uh, it happens quite a bit down there. And uh, I left a prayer group, uh, and I went down and walked the streets and went into some of the rather difficult neighbor, uh, neighborhoods. And I talked to the people that live down there, and we got to talking about it. And, you know, they, they forgive. It's, it's, it's really unique. Uh, they forgive right away. It's just those who are part of that consciousness that feeds that same frenzy between the police and the uh, people that are having problems. Uh, it, it's just that whole consciousness. Uh, and that, and that's, that's what I wanted to call about and talk to you about. Uh, don't you see how the consciousness of certain areas just kind of keep bubbling up around the, around the United States and these uh, course of actions that can't be resolved just keep getting worse and worse? Uh, yes, but I'm not sure I understand you completely. You're saying that in some neighborhoods that the conflicts between the police and the residents get resolved, and in other cases they just are a constant source of agitation and hostility? Well, well, actually, oh, like, well, for instance, I'm from Dayton, Ohio, and they have literally burned half of that city twice. Um, well, I, what happened uh, a couple of years ago, uh, a young black man got beat senseless. Uh, down around uh, where the bus station is, and it was in the news a lot. And I went down there, and I was talking to some of the black kids that are on the street, and uh, we talked to them, and they thought nothing of it. Um, and to me, it would outrage me, yeah, you know, because uh, uh, your civil rights uh, it aren't, aren't really a question when you're stopped by police when there's hatred going on. Uh, there's no consideration of this. It's not even thought of. It's you pulled out of the car, you're looked at, and whatever. you don't have to flinch. You could be scared to death. And you could be on the ground with somebody's knee in your back. It, you don't have to provoke a situation when the whole thing down there is going on, mm-hmm. if, you know, if you know what I mean. Yes, I do. I understand. Uh, Bill, thanks so much for your call. I appreciate it. And before we go back to the phones, I have an interesting email from Dave in Sacramento who says his comment concerns a caller who told you that you have a duty to obey police o- orders and laws because you can always get enough people to change the laws if you don't like them. Aside from the impracticality of changing laws, which you already explained, your naive caller makes another error. He assumes that whatever the majority says is morally right. Murray Rothbard, the economics professor, reduced this position to absurdity by saying, well, what if 80% of the population voted to kill the other 20%? Would that automatically make it right to kill people in the 20% group? Of course not. Therefore, majority rule can't possibly be the criterion for what is morally right. Rothbard points out that Hitler and the Nazis rose to power through a perfectly democratic process. So by the reasoning of your caller, we can't say that Jews and others killed by the Nazis were murdered. We can only say that these victims committed a sort of democratic suicide by living under a democratically elected regime that wanted them dead. And finally, Dave says, I want to correct your caller on a very common fallacy he made. He said you have a duty to do whatever the cops tell you to do. You said, so if they tell me to take off my clothes, I should do it. He then accused you of using an extreme example. That's exactly what you were doing. You were using an extreme example to show that the caller's sweeping statement was false. The mere fact that a counterexample is extreme is not a weakness of that counterexample. It makes it stronger and even more persuasive. I wish your caller would take a course in critical thinking. Uh, well, that's true. And the fact that the counterexample seems to be sweet, uh, s- extreme is really pointing out the extreme nature of the statement that was made in the first place, the sweeping assertion, in this case, that you have a duty to obey the police. 
Well, let's talk now with Chuck in California, and my apologies to the others who are still on the line. We're going to get to everybody tonight one way or the other. Chuck, good evening. We have just a minute before we go to the break, but I'd like you to get us started before we well, go to the break. Well, I have two thoughts. One I can handle in a minute, and one I would like to deal with a little bit longer. Okay. A libertarian friend of mine pointed out to me the solution to the problem that you're asking for tonight, mm-hmm. and that is if policemen were to be viewed as peace officers instead of law enforcement officers. Then the job of the police would be to make peace in a given situation and not uh, look in the law book to see what uh, law this guy's uh, disobeying so they can pound the hell out of him. Right. I understand what you're saying. Well, in many cases, they do refer to them as peace officers. Unfortunately, it's just not taken seriously. It's like calling our armies the defenders of freedom when they're over there taking freedom away from people in other countries. Chuck, uh, hang on, and we'll get to your second point right after we come back from these important announcements. This is Harry Brown. I'm so glad you decided to stay with us tonight. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Hello again, Harry Brown here. Before we go back to Chuck in Arizona, uh, pardon me, California, I got a message from Dave in Phoenix, Arizona, which I am really surprised to read. He says, I haven't kept up recently, but USA Today on Wednesdays and New York Times on Sundays in the recent past would print two full pages each week in fine print of asset forfeitures for just that week. I would estimate that there were a couple hundred examples listed in these papers each week. Well, I didn't know anything about that. I haven't been reading newspapers for years. I've been getting all my information off the Internet. I'm going to CNN, New York Times, Washington Post, other places on the Internet. I haven't subscribed to a newspaper in several years. In fact, I quit subscribing to hard copies of magazines. If anybody knows about this, about USA Today or the New York Times printing asset forfeiture cases once a week, I would certainly like to know more about it. So please email me. You can email me, question at harrybrown.org. Brown has an E. Or call in next week. Calling in this week would be too late because we still have a lineup of of callers waiting. And my apologies to everybody who has been waiting on the phone. We're going to get to everybody tonight or I'm going to die trying. And, well, I don't live in Cincinnati, but I'll still die trying. Chuck, are you still with us? I'm here. What's up now? You had a second? Well, the guy that uh, was uh, saying that you should obey the police, Mm -hmm. uh, there's two comments I'd like to make about him. I think he is a policeman because he made a comment about uh, he's really disgusted that people uh, do not are not able to you know walk in a policeman's moccasin, so to speak. Sure. And secondly, he said, in a democracy, well, this is not a democracy, and it was never intended to be a democracy. In fact, the Constitution was written for the express purpose of preventing democracy, of course. as the founding fathers clearly pointed out. Yes, it, this is what distinguished America from other countries, in that the government was expressly limited to a certain group of functions and expressly prohibited from getting involved in any others, meaning that you could vote yourself silly, but the government still couldn't do it because it was not a proper function of government in the eyes of the founding fathers. So just going out and getting a majority of people to pass a law, as Murray Rothbard said, to kill 20% of the people, that's not going to do it. And it's the same thing if you say, well, we're going to take the money from 20% of the people, or we're going to make them obey certain restrictions in the way they conduct their business, or we're going to tell them what they can smoke or we're going to tell them what they can drink, or we're going to tell them what they can eat, or what kind of guns they can own, or any of these things. None of that was the province of government in the United States. That's the difference between a republic and a democracy. A republic is a government that is strictly limited by a written constitution. Well, okay. Thank you, Perry. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry to, to go on so long while you were making the case so well. Let's go now to Mark in New Orleans. And this is the other Mark in New Orleans. Are you with us this evening, yes. Mark? Yes. Good evening. Uh, how are you doing? Just fine. Thanks uh, uh, for calling. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to say something about uh, Rex. I would uh, recommend that he read the book. It will do, it'll do him a lot of good if he does. Uh, titled The Law by Frederick Bastiat. He will understand, if he reads it and is intellectually honest, the, mean, the real meaning of law. And law is not what the, the whim of the politicians. All the edicts. Uh, I, I think he confuses law with edict. You know, this, the, 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 the commands that the politicians have for, you know, for us, the sheep, to follow. I think that's what he's referring to. And yes. let me just mention the fact that you can obey everything the cops tell you, and you can still come out losing. In fact, you may even lose your life. You may be very peaceful, very quiet, very compliant, and yet they'll still torture you and abuse you and poke your fingers in your side and do all sorts of things. I have seen it. I have seen it. This happens all the time. And they're not going to do it to, uh, to uh, Governor Bush's daughter or some, you know, some famous politicians. These cops know to whom... They do it. Uh, and, uh, yes, there are good cops, but unfortunately uh, the, the 95% of the damage is done by the bad ones, and there's quite a few of them. And, uh, unfortunately, we don't have, uh, you know, civilian review boards anywhere to, uh, in, in the United States, I believe. Uh, you know, they've disappeared because, uh, you know, the fascists have, you know, uh, have won all, all the way around, and, you know, they have been eliminated and wherever they have existed. But I wanted to mention something about, the, you know, this most uh, very recent Supreme Court decision about the Fourth Amendment. Uh, I don't know if you read about it, but the Fourth Amendment is now dead. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the Supreme Court pretty much gave 
the go-ahead for cops to pretty much violate the Fourth Amendment at whim. Uh, explain that to us, Mark, when we come back from this sure. break. And we will be back in just uh, two or three minutes, so please stay with us. We have another half hour to go. This is Harry Brown. I'm so glad you're listening in this evening. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown, and before Mark continues, let me mention that I have put on the Radio Links page a link to the Amazon page for The Law by Frederick Bastiat. It is a wonderful book. It's very short. You can read it in an hour or an hour and a half, and it really does a good job of defining the difference between what we might call good laws and bad laws. And Mark brought that up uh, when he uh, began his uh, call earlier before we took the break. So if you go to my website, harrybrown.org, click on the radio page, and then click on links to articles and websites mentioned on the show, and that will take you to the page, which also has Lou Rockwell's excellent article on the Cincinnati incident. Mark, you're still with us, aren't you? Yes, I am. And you said you were saying before we went to the break that the Supreme Court has invalidated the Fourth Amendment, and now if you would explain exactly what it was that uh, they ruled. Yes, that there was a case of, uh, of, uh, of uh, police uh, busting the door down of a, of a suspect, a uh, drug suspect, uh, supposedly, and uh, they just did that, and uh, the, uh, he, the man was convicted. He appealed his conviction on the grounds that, there was, uh, that he didn't have time to, to even answer the, uh, the knock because he was taking a shower. And uh, in, in the appeals, uh, uh, the, the, his conviction was overturned. So it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court uh, pretty much said, in essence, that the police can do that. They can, they can give you just 15 seconds to answer. And, uh, I mean, who's going to answer uh, at the 2 a.m. in the morning yes. you know, when you have all these, uh, all these uh, fierce gorillas? You know, knocking on your door and uh, with guns. Sure, you may open be, the door. You may also be in the bathtub. Uh, you may be in the back room. You may be in a lot of different places. Uh, once again, the problem is the police that's, that's have. What, been... What's important is what the the the, the, uh, the, the, the suitor said. Suitor said that the Fourth Amendment, which we know is about unreasonable searches and seizures, he says that, that the defendant didn't get it. It's about what the police expect. Can you believe that? In yeah. other words, what the police want. That's what the Fourth Amendment is. The founding fathers must be turning on their graves. If it, you know, listen to this, what this idiot who happens to be sitting in the Supreme Court had to say. Well, he knows that the Redcoats know what was best for the rebels in uh, 1776 and that it's what the Redcoats expected. And those rebels had the crazy idea that somehow the people should be protected from the police and from the military who wanted to invade their homes whenever they wanted to. Mark, thanks so much for calling. I appreciate it. Once again, I have to say that the problem is not the police. It is that the police are drowning in laws that have been inflicted upon them by the lawmakers and created situations where it seems to the police as though they have to engage in these practices in order both to stay alive and in order to do their so-called duty. The reason I couldn't get Dave in Florida answered before is because Dave is in Arizona. And are you with us, David, in Arizona? Yes, Harry, I sure am. Okay, good. Let's start over again then. What's on your mind tonight? Well, I'm a fairly new libertarian. I've been studying for a couple of years and uh, voted for the Libertarian Party in the last election. But it was uh, really in 1972, and in my, the first election I could vote in, that I was aware that there's really only one party in the country, mm -hmm. you know, comprised of Republicans and, and Democrats. Yes. But I had a lot of questions about libertarianism that, for example, and I don't want to ask a whole bunch of them, so if you just answer one, I'd appreciate it. Yes, let's take one tonight and then give us sure. another one next week. Sure. If, for, well, there's a, a, a lot of news going around about eliminating taxes, and I certainly, you know, we all got to be for that. But if we eliminated taxes, the money that it would put into our pockets uh, would be tremendous. But what about all the people that would be unemployed as, as we eliminated government work? You mean the government employees? Yes, yes. Well, of course, the more money that's in private hands, the more demand there is for private services, and the more private services will have to hire more people to take care of the demand that comes from the people that now have more money to spend. And you can think that this might take a transition period of two years, three years, five years to ease it so that people are not wrenched out of jobs and so on. But the fact is the free market works very, very quickly, and especially in these days of instant communication. It's, there's an in interesting example of this. At the end of the Second World War, there were 10 million Americans in uniform fighting the Second World War. When the war ended, Congress started to debate how are we going to make the transition of these 10 million government employees to the private sector. We've got to have some grand plan to make this possible. And the Republicans and the Democrats debated and argued about this. In the meantime, nine or nine and a half of the 10 million people were mustered out of the service. They all found jobs. The economy took off like a bandit. And everything was all right simply because they never got around to passing a transition program to take care of these 10 million people getting out of the service. So you're saying the economy can go without war, right? Oh, absolutely. War destroys the economy. Let's bring our troops home, and then we can lower the taxes. I'd be all for that. Well, you got it, David. I'm all, all the way with you on that. Thanks so much for calling, and stay with us, and come back next week with more questions. Ben in Idaho, good evening. Hi, Harry. How are you this evening? Oh, pretty good. I told him you must be awful busy tonight. We are, and that's very nice. We hot topic tonight. Well, a few things uh, on your first caller from uh, Phoenix. Uh, 
Uh, my uh, professor 40 years ago in government political science 101 described America's form of government as a democratic federated republic. Well, that makes sense. It encompasses three things. The republic we already discussed, the fact that government is limited, federated, in that it was a federation of states. It wasn't until Abraham Lincoln came along that suddenly the word nation was imposed, that this was a one nation, and so on. Before that, it was always taken to be a, a confederation of sovereign states who had banded together to have a federal government perform certain functions that they didn't feel could be for, performed at the state level. And democratic comes into play in that the people who administer these things are democratically elected, but they do not have carte blanche to do whatever they want because once again this is a republic so democratic federated republic is a good way of putting exactly what the original idea was uh, another thing that i thought was interesting uh, you call it from phoenix uh, perhaps the closest thing we have to uh, a nazi style uh, concentration camp in america is maricopa county and the sheriff's department uh, the prisons oh, live out in tents is that the one where the tough love uh, sheriff yeah. <laughs> that, that was in the news five or six years well, ago terrible <laughs> what, what goes on there uh, you know if, if you take uh, any of the, the Phoenix newspapers, I don't think a month goes by that someone isn't uh, beaten to death in the prison uh, uh, by, by the sheriff's deputies. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a real scary thing. So bad when I lived in Arizona, I, I was afraid of uh, breaking down on the highway going through Maricopa County. Ah, you know? uh, yes. <laughs> like, like a bad movie, right? <laughs> like a bad movie. Another thing, too, about good news, one of the things that was, uh, I'm, I'm calling from Idaho, I'm a Montanan, as I think you know, and uh, one of the best things that ever happened in the legislature of Montana happened about 20 years ago. And the legislature of Montana made it illegal for any unit of Montana government, county, city, state, uh, to uh, arrest anyone for public intoxication. Really? And, uh, oh, that was really promoted by American Indians. That was one of the, the great games that was played on a few off-reservation towns was uh, wait till, uh the per capita checks came in and, and uh, middle-aged elderly Indians walked into town and, and got drunk. And, you know, they had, you know, $150 on them, so you would uh, arrest them and set the bail at $150 mm-hmm. or whatever. Right. And, uh and, finance the local government. Yeah, finance local government. And they just outlawed that. And the only way that you can uh, arrest anyone under public intoxication is if they're breaking some other law, like attacking someone, driving drunk. Sure. But just to be, uh, it doesn't say alcohol, just public intoxication is not right. a crime in Montana as of circa 1980-81 in there. Which would apply to drugs as well. Very interesting. Uh, well, we only have 49 more states to go. <laughs> <laughs> ben, thanks so much for your call. Always good to hear from you. Thanks. And let's go now across the street in Tennessee here to Barbara. Barbara, I'm sorry you've had to wait so long this evening. That's okay, Harry. So good to talk to you. I, I listen to your show every week. And, uh, I just saw on, uh, my email, Freedom you're going to be in Atlanta. Yes. Uh, in, in January. You're always so far away, I've never had the opportunity to see you. Um, what part, guess, of Ten- what part of Tennessee are you in, Barbara? Chattanooga, Tennessee. Oh, Chattanooga, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, yes, I should mention for the benefit mostly of me, but also for the benefit of the other uh, people listening to the show, that Michael Cloud and I will be conducting a libertarian persuasion seminar. I believe it is the weekend of January 23rd. I don't have the information in front of me. Your, your email is 24th and 25th. 24th and 25th, a Saturday and Sunday. It'll be in Atlanta, Georgia. And if you would like information about that and don't get my Freedom Wire messages weekly or so, then just send a note to me at question at harrybrown.org, and I'll be glad to send you the information on it. Yeah. Um, the caller from Arizona. Um, he, I guess he really stirred up a lot of people. I, I, um, I, I don't know if he's if he's a cop or if he's like so many people around, at least around here. They they think that um, if if you're not doing anything wrong, then you don't have anything to worry about. But um, in the, our local paper last week, there was a man um, uh, driving from here, from local man. He was in Loudoun County, Tennessee. And he'd been to Kentucky because his father was dying, and his father had given him cash, twenty thousand dollars, in a bank bag, and um, he had spent a little bit of it. It was, you know, nineteen thousand, whatever. And um, the police pulled him over for a traffic violation, a routine traffic stop. And uh, so, rather than give them all of the money, they coerced him into giving him uh, uh, ten thousand dollars. He signed the papers and everything to go to the drug fund. <laughs> so Swell. he went home, I guess, and thought about it and filed a lawsuit against them. And um, he eventually got his ten thousand dollars back. I I think that the probably the sheriff there uh, never intended on taking his case to the Department of Safety, who's supposed to decide in civil asset forfeiture if if he's supposed to get his money back or not. But rather than do that, they gave him his money back, which doesn't happen all the time. Yes, but, it's not unusual at all. As a matter of fact, it's uh it's kind of coincidentally strange that this topic came up today. I had not matched them up, but I just put up on my website today a new article of my own called Your Innocence is No Protection. And when I put the article up, I wasn't even thinking about the Cincinnati case. It is really an excerpt from my book, Why Government Doesn't Work, which is now available at libertyfree.com. But 
in that, I detail a number of cases, including uh, asset forfeiture cases, that uh, where the fact that you're innocent is no protection from <laughs> the police at all. And, of course, I introduced the article by saying that people supporting the Patriot Act say, don't worry about it. If you're not a terrorist, if you're innocent, you have nothing to fear. But the fact is that innocent people are being subjected to abuse all the time. And, in fact, it is the guilty that know how to get around any new law that is supposed to get the guilty, while the innocent, completely oblivious to the fact that the war law has been passed, will walk right into a, a trap and the next thing you know, they are in trouble. Oh, we have to run to a commercial. If you have something more to say, Barbara, just hang on. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Sorry I interrupted you before and uh, before you got a chance to complete your point. So That's okay. I know you're short on time. Um, I, I just want to say that the, the man who got his $10,000 back, they found no drugs. And um, uh, about the beating, um, there's a website, uh, StopTheDrugWar.org, mm -hmm. and um, every Friday um, they uh, send out a newsletter called The Drug War Chronicle. And right now they have the, the uh, video uh, and how busted, and it's the citizen got to surviving police encounters. I'm and sorry, say, would you say that last line again? It's the citizen's guide to surviving police encounters. The citizen's guide to surviving police encounters, I mm -hmm. see. So, uh, stop the org. You can get the video. Okay. Uh, and, and, and a whole lot of other useful information. There, uh, maybe nothing can ever be done, but like you, at least they try. Well, I remain hopeful that we will end this ridiculous war on drugs. Mm -hmm. And when we do, I think you will find that the amount of violent crime in the society will go down considerably because then the police can focus on the job that we think that they're supposedly doing, which is to stop the violence. Do you think it's possible in our lifetime? I think it is. I'm not as optimistic as I was a few years ago. At one time, I was saying that I thought the drug war would be over in five years, and I've been proven wrong on that. But I still think that there are more and more people all the time who are coming to realize that this is a terrible mistake. Barbara, mm -hmm. thanks so much for calling. I appreciate Thank it. You. Always glad to hear from you. My Thank apologies you. to the people that we didn't get to tonight and to the emails we didn't. I'd like to wind up with an email from Jonathan in Washington, D.C., who uh, always has something interesting to say. I th he says, I think it's healthy to be suspicious of government officials in general. However, it's long bothered me that many libertarians have a hatred for police officers. Of course, there are some officers who abuse their power and hurt pe peaceful citizens, but many police officers also apprehend violent or intrusive people, and that's something libertarians should support. I assure you that here in the District of Columbia, the murder capital of America, it's not the police who are doing the killing. Well, a couple of things I need to say about this, and I appreciate what you're saying, Jonathan. It's interesting that George Bush thinks he's going to get rid of all the evildoers in the world, but the United States government has oversight of the District of Columbia. They can't even get rid of the evildoers in Washington, D.C., but they're going to go make Iran and Iraq and Syria and Libya and Afghanistan and all these other places peaceful and secure and law-abiding and so on when they can't even bring this about in the area over, over which they have jurisdiction right there in the District of Columbia. But once again, it is the system that's bad, and we need to find a better way. It isn't important that you know exactly how all these problems could be solved. The first step is to realize that government isn't solving them. Can you imagine if we had private roads in this country? There would not be 50,000 people dying on the roads every year in traffic accidents because that's bad for business. Can you imagine if we had private postal service in this country, first-class mail delivered by competing companies, that you would get guaranteed delivery, that every address in the country could have home delivery, just as is the case with FedEx and UPS on courier mail and packages? Can you imagine if somehow we could have a private defense system in this country or several of them competing to have you help them defend this country? that we would be spending trillions and trillions of dollars over the years and finding ourselves living in fear of foreign countries, living in fear of terrorists, and being constantly stirred up by the government. There have to be better ways than what we're getting for the nearly half of our incomes that are going to federal, state, and local governments. That's the first step, is to realize that government doesn't work, that government is not the answer, that forcing people to do things is not the way to get what you want in this world. Even if you don't know what the alternative is, you at least have to begin by recognizing that this system is not working, that this is a bad system, and quit supporting it, and quit supporting the politicians who are just making the system worse by making government bigger, more intrusive, and more powerful year after year after year. Thanks so much to Aaron Armstrong for taking care of the engineering duties tonight. More than anything else, thank you for tuning in. I hope you tune in again next week. This is Harry Brown. Have a good week.